All right. Welcome, everyone. Nice to see all the faces. Oh, that's so cool. Ooh, and I see a door. Nice door. Reminds me of the game Gone Home, where you're in this creepy house and it's there's lightning and rain outside. And uh, yeah, it's a fun game, but the sounds <laughs> are scary and every room is dark. All right, we still got a few people joining, so I'm admitting them. Welcome. There's my background. Introducing our guest presenter today, so excited. All right, well, before we start, I'm just gonna make a few science announcements. Uh, for those of you that are here, welcome to this week's science Zoom meeting. And I just want to make sure that everybody is, uh, I've been sh making videos and sharing this, but I wanna make sure everybody knows because this was something you didn't really have to do in class. In class, if I sent you a message and you saw a green dot here on the message part of Classcraft, you didn't really have to check it because the person next to you probably knew what I said or I said it out loud and I was right there and you could ask me. Uh, but now that I'm not there and you can't turn and ask me and you may or may not be able to turn and ask your friend, this mm -hmm. messaging part is very important. So here you see class announcement, sixth grade. Most of you may know if you see sixth grade, that's a, a question or a comment that I just asked you. Um, but the class announcement one is where I share announcements for everyone. So there's the link to today's Zoom. And you should be seeing all the random events. I still do a random event every day, Monday through Friday, between 10 and 11. And then I deal with stuff in the evening. So right now in period three, Romulan's attacked. Everyone's taking damage. Uh, so warriors, you get a chance to uh, protect. And you can see, you got to scroll up to see everything you've missed. And those of you who haven't checked in a while, you're probably scrolling up quite a ways and you're like, ah, so much stuff. But look for things that are like videos uh, where I help you get your assignments done. I've been recording a lot of videos to make sure everybody gets support uh, and instruction on what you need. So if you have any questions, message me here. Go to sixth grade and then type your message in there, Mr. G, and then send it. And I'll get it and I'll be able to respond. And if you have any questions or comments today, make sure you put them in the chat room. Uh, Ms. Berg is also a co-host, so she and I will be monitoring the chat, checking your questions. And uh, if Ryan asks you a question, you can just answer in the chat. We will read it. Uh, but if you do want to be unmuted, Ms. Berg or I can unmute you and you can uh, answer the question. And I see that Riley has a hand up. So let me unmute you and let's hear what you have to say. Go ahead, Riley. Oh, that, um, I don't know how to change my name. It's my sister's name still. So. Ah, so it's not Riley. All right, so did you have a question or comment? I can uh, no, that. I just wanted to wonder how to change my name. Did you said use your real name? Got it. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Ms. Berg. All right. So while people are getting all situated, hopefully we've got everybody here. Um, I just am really happy to introduce uh, Ryan, who's a Chimicum graduate. And uh, she attended Evergreen State College and she got a Bachelor of Arts and Science with an emphasis in ecology and environmental chemistry. And uh, she's now working with North Olympic Salmon Coalition, which we partner with. We have been for years. Um, and she's worked in water quality. So this is perfect that she's our guest today. I'm so excited. 
and uh, she's got a great lesson for you. And I'm going to go to my screen so I can stop sharing. And I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. Uh, you can go ahead and share your screen and you are on. Okay, thanks, Al. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Mr. Gonzalez was my eighth grade science teacher for a bit. Uh, and that was way back in the day when iPads just came out and we all had <laughs> flip phones. Uh, so I'm feeling thankful for this technology uh, and that we get to still learn cool stuff from home. Um, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen with a presentation for you. Okay, so today we are going to be learning about benthic macroinvertebrates. Uh, and hint, they are bugs that live in rivers. And we will be um, learning about what they are, how you can find them in rivers, and what they can tell us about the environment. And so I used to not really like bugs. I thought they were gross and annoying and scary, but the more I started learning about them, the more awesome I realized they were. Okay, so benthic macroinvertebrate, that is a big word, but I'll break it down for you. So these are basically just bugs that spend some part of their life in the water. So benthic means that they live on the bottom of the stream. Macro means that you can see them without a microscope. You can just see them with your eyes. And invertebrate means that they live without a backbone. And so these include things like worms, snails, clams, mussels, and insects like beetles or flies. So I want to know in the chat box, have you ever seen any of these in a river before? Ooh, maybe I can't see the chat box. We've got a bunch of yeses and yes. I mean, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Macroinvertebrates live everywhere in the stream. They live on rocks like this. Let me get my little laser pointer. They can live on rocks like this one up here. They can live, um, or so I guess this one has attached itself to a rock, or they can walk freely around rocks like these ones down here. They can live on leaves like these ones, and they can burrow in the sediment and live in the sand like these ones up here. And they eat a bunch of different things. They can be herbivores. What do herbivores eat? Feel free to type in the chat room or raise your hand. We've got plants. People are typing in yeah. plants. Yeah, herbivores eat plants. There are some macroinvertebrates that are carnivores. What do carnivores eat? Meat. <laughs> yeah. So I guess in the case of Most people are spelling it right. <laughs> so in the case of macroinvertebrates, this means that macroinvertebrates eat other macroinvertebrates, or they can be detritivores. Have you ever heard of a detritivore? No. <laughs> Got some nose. No. Okay, can you guess what they eat by, from the picture right Ooh, here? Somebody wrote decomposer. Yeah, so like detritivores eat dead plant material. So they munch on leaves and twigs and just other parts of dead plants that fall into streams. And these little guys are really important they cycle nutrients in the ecosystem. And what this means is that they can take something like a leaf or a twig and they break it down into really tiny little pieces so that those nutrients then can be used by other plants. They also are food for animals. 
What kinds of things do you think eat macroinvertebrates? Salmon, fish, fish, bears. Yeah. Bears. <laughs> Maybe not bears. We got a lot of fish, 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 sand. Yeah, fish. In addition to fish, amphibians, like maybe frogs or salamanders eat macroinvertebrates. Birds, birds can eat macroinvertebrates. Um, but yeah, fish, that is an important one. Um, so little salmon, they depend on macroinvertebrates as a food source so that they can get big and strong before going out to the ocean. So yeah, that was a really good answer. And another reason why macroinvertebrates are really important is that they are a bioindicator of water quality. And so that means that they can tell us how healthy a stream is. Uh, and we will talk more about that in a few slides. There are thousands and thousands of different species of macroinvertebrates. There are so many, but they all go through one of two different life cycles. So the first life cycle they go through is called complete metamorphosis. Can you think of another insect that goes through metamorphosis? We got dragonflies, caterpillar, butterfly. Yeah. Butterfly. Fly, moth. E yes, I'm not sure about flies, but like, yeah, butterflies, dragonflies, yeah. And so what we do is in complete metamorphosis, and this is an example for what um, is called a caddis fly, you start with an egg, and then it hatches into this worm-like thing called larva. And then in the case of a caddis fly, this one actually builds itself a case made out of rocks or sometimes little twigs, and it becomes a pupa. And then um, this pupa, then it'll break out of its case and become an adult with wings on land. So it's like these three stages of the life cycle are in the water, and then this last one is on land. The next one that some other species go through is called incomplete metamorphosis. And this is an example for a stonefly. And what this looks like is you start with eggs, and then it hatches into a little bug like this, and it basically just grows into a larger version of itself. So you can kind of see the difference where like this one completely transforms from larva into like this new sort of shape, whereas over here it just kind of keeps to the same shape, and that's why it's called an incomplete metamorphosis. But again, it turns into an adult and it flies on land. So these stages right here are in the water and the adult stage is on land. Okay, so back to that word bioindicator. So a bioindicator is a living thing that gives us an idea about the health of the environment. And macroinvertebrates are really good bioindicators because they are affected by the water around them. So there are some species that need like really clean, cold, well oxygenated water to live, but there are others that can survive in polluted waters. Um, so if you, yeah, polluted, bad, we don't like polluted water, we like good quality water. Um, and again, that's like just a clean, cold, lots of oxygen, not a lot of dirt in it. Um, that's good quality water. So if you look at what types of macroinvertebrates are in the stream, then you can kind of see if the water is good quality or maybe not so great quality. And so I'm going to show you some examples of what those macroinvertebrates are. So here are some that are pollution tolerant, and that means that they are able to live in 
somewhat polluted water. And these include things like midge fly larvae, leeches, aquatic worms, and black fly larvae. So if you're seeing a lot of these in the stream, then the water might not be so great. There are some species that can tolerate a little bit of pollution. And these are called scuds, damselflies, and dragonflies. And these are just a few examples. There's a lot more um, than this. And then there are pollution intolerant macroinvertebrates. That means that they cannot live in polluted water and they need clean water to live in. And these are caddisflies, stoneflies, mayflies, and water pennies. Those are some examples. And again, they need clean water that's high in oxygen, it's cold, it's clear. So if you're seeing a lot of these in the water, then you know, okay, that's good quality water and we want that. So um, a lot of the times scientists will use these three right here, the caddisfly, stonefly, and mayfly to determine water quality. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those. So mayflies, that's the first one I'm going to talk about. These are like, these are like the ballerinas of the macroinvertebrate world. They are very dainty and when they are adults, they dance above the water. And you can tell you're looking at a mayfly because it has three tails. Um, and they also have one claw at the end of each little leg. And so you can kind of remember mayfly has three tails because it kind of looks like an M. If that, if you can see that, the tails look like an M for mayfly. Um, so the little ones, when they're in the water, they're mainly herbivores, meaning that they eat plants like little algae and other plants in the water. Um, but when they are adults, they live for such a short amount of time that they don't need to eat. So they don't have a working mouth. They only live for about an hour to a day. Um, and again, these are pollution sensitive, which means that they do not like to live in uh, polluted waters. So remember, mayflies have three tails and they have one claw. Stone flies, um, these are macroinvertebrates and they have two tails and two claws. Two tails, two claws, like this. And these ones eat a lot more. They can be herbivores, carnivores, or detritivores. Okay, I have a poll for you. Can you pull up the first question, Al? So, let's try to remember. What do detritivores eat? Okay. Do we remember what a detritivore eats? Everybody vote and choose your answer. We're 44% through 55, 58, 72, 75, 82% have voted. Almost everyone, if you haven't voted, you've got a few more seconds. And two, one, the polling is closed. And here's how you voted. All right. So most of you chose uh, the correct answer, which was that detritivores eat dead uh, plant matter, such as the leaves and the twigs and bark. Um, again, uh, macroinvertebrates that eat living plants and algae, those are called herbivores. So now do I stop sharing, Al? I got it. Okay. For some reason, it's still up on my end. Oh, how's that? It's still in the middle of the okay. screen. Uh-oh. 
Oh, I think I got it. I got it. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, another really cool thing about stoneflies is that since they need a lot of oxygen to live, um, if they aren't getting enough, they actually can do push-ups in the water to make the water flow over them uh, so that they can get more oxygen. And they actually take that oxygen in like through their body, through their skin. Um, and once it's time for it to become an adult, the skin on its head and thorax splits apart and an adult with wings like climbs out of it. So it's kind of like it's molting. Um, so if you are seeing a lot of mayflies and stoneflies in the water, you've got good water quality. Yeah, Cash, I see the claps. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the last one I'm going to talk about is called a caddisfly. And caddisflies are super duper cool because they build cases around themselves out of things like rocks or twigs or like little pine needles. Um, and there's also another type of caddisfly that builds nets around itself. If you look at this picture right here where my laser pointer is pointing, you can see that this caddisfly has built itself a net and it uses that to capture food. So it's kind of like, like a little spider underwater, um, but most of them are case builders. Um, and again, these breathe, caddisflies breathe through their skin and they eat all sorts of things. They are carnivores, herbivores, and detritivores. And what these stoneflies do is they, so they build themselves a case and then they wrap themselves in silk and become a little cocoon. And then they, once they transform into an adult, they use their big mandibles to break out of their case and swim to the surface as an adult um, with wings. And even though they have wings, they are pretty bad flyers though. Um, so normally this is the part where, you know, we might bring macroinvertebrates to class and you could see some for yourself and observe them and identify them. Uh, but since we can't do that today, I actually made a little video for you to show you how you can go out and collect your own macroinvertebrates. And it's about five minutes long. showing you how you can collect your own sample of macroinvertebrates. For this sample, I've chosen an area of the creek with a rocky bottom and a nice flow. Normally, scientists and biologists use different types of nets, uh, but for today, I just have a strainer that you might have in your kitchen. I'm going to be placing this into the water so that the stream water is flowing through the net. I'm going to agitate the stream bed right in front of the net. It's easier to have a partner for this part, so I'm going to need a little help. My friend Tom is going to hold this tub for me while I remove the big rocks right in front of the net. We'll save those for later. I'm going to be using my hand to mix up the stream bed, also known as the for about 10 seconds so that the macroinvertebrates flow into the net. We got the bugs. Now I've come back to the tub of larger rocks that we had pulled out and I'm going to be using a small brush, you could use a toothbrush if you wanted to, um, to brush the macroinvertebrates that are stuck to the rocks into uh, this tub. So I'm just going to pour a little water in here. 
You can see that we've got a caddisfly right here that's been crawling around. Once all the worms and caddisflies are off, you can just toss these back into the stream. Then I'm going to dump the sample into a tub and rinse off the stuff that is stuck with this bit of creek water. To drain off the water and then put some of the sample in this small dish. And try not to dump out any macaron vertebrates. I've got a second dish with some clean creek water that I am going to be placing the macro and vertebrates in. So here we can tell that we have a caddis fly because of the rock case that it has built for itself. It's pretty cool that we get to see it walking around. A lot of the times caddis flies look like this one and it just looks like a pile of rocks. If you flip it over, you can see that there is um, a caddis fly in there. And then up here, we have a mayfly. And I can tell it's a mayfly because it has three tails. And unfortunately, this little guy right here, he lost his tails in the sample collection process. So I'm unsure if this is a stonefly or a mayfly. Sorry, little guy. And these two right here, these look like midgefly larvae. Even though they look like tiny worms, I can tell they are midges because they have a hardened type of skin on their head. Here's a different sample. I'm finding a lot more worms and more midges, and these are more tolerant of polluted waters. You can see that different samples will have different macroinvertebrates. So to make a conclusion about whether or not this stream water is good quality, we would have to take many samples in many different places to get the whole picture. Okay. So I highly recommend that you go out the next time you are at a stream or a river or a creek uh, and you find some macroinvertebrates and it definitely doesn't have to be as fancy as that. You can really just pick up a rock and see what you find. So scientists have come up with different ways that they can use macroinvertebrates to sort of like rate the quality um, of the water to see if it's good or bad. And so I have an example here that I'm just going to quickly fill out to show you all. Um, so in this first, oops, ah. Okay, in this uh, first row, uh, we have the like groups of macroinvertebrates. So the ones over here are very intolerant to pollution. That means they do not like pollution. Um, and then the ones over here, they, they are able to live more in pollution. So I found mayflies and caddisflies. 
And then in the more pollution tolerant section, I found midges and worms. And so then what I did next was I took the number of check marks and I multiplied it by this underlined number down here. And I did that all the way across. So I had two checks and I multiplied it by four and I got eight. And then I got one check over there and I multiplied it by two and got two. And then one check for the worms and I multiplied it by one and got one. And then I added that all together, I got 11. And I went over to my water quality assessment chart and I saw that from 11 to 16, if you had a score from 11 to 16, uh, which I had 11, then that is potentially fair water quality. Um, but again, yeah, it's like, it's not great, but again, this was just one sample and you really need a lot to make some sort of conclusion. But for the sample I chose, uh, it, was, it showed that the water had potentially fair water quality. Okay, so now I have some more polls for you all. Um, okay, so let's do, like, let's pretend this is your water sample or your macroinvertebrate sample. And you saw these two. Which, which macroinvertebrates are they? There are your options. Ten people have voted. Eleven, thirteen, fourteen. We're halfway there. Sixteen, eighteen. Ooh, the votes are coming in. All right, keep voting. Twenty. We're almost done. I'm going to give you three more seconds and two and one and closing now. And here's what you got. Okay, so most of or a large percent of you uh, said stonefly is on the left and mayfly is on the right, and that is correct. Uh, stoneflies, if you remember, have two tails and mayflies have three. Um, so if you found a stonefly and a mayfly in your sample, what would that indicate about the water quality? And that's the next poll, Al. What would that tell you? Like, would this, would the water be good quality or maybe polluted? All right, and people have started choosing their answer. Got 12, 15, 17. 18, 19. I'm going to give you three more seconds, counting down. Three, two, one, and closing the poll now. Here's what you got. Okay, well, it looks like we're about half and half on this one. Uh, but the answer is if you found stoneflies and mayflies in your sample, that is good quality. Yeah, that is a, that's a good thing. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Okay, if you found a lot of aquatic worms and midges in your sample, uh, what might that tell you about the water quality? And that's the next poll. Uh, Got it. Okay. All right, there you go, folks. All right, the votes are coming in. We're at eight, nine, 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 17, 18, 19, 20. And we're gonna close this one in three and two and one. And here are your results. Okay. So most of you said that if you found a lot of worms or midges in your sample, that that would indicate that the stream water might be a little polluted. And that is totally right. Um, 
there were a lot of votes for a lot of oxygen in the water. Um, and that, that isn't correct because if there's a lot of oxygen in the water, that's actually a really good thing. And that means that the water is high quality. Um, so yeah, the answer, if you found worms and midges, then the stream water might be somewhat polluted. Okay, I have, this one might be a little tricky, but I have one more um, question for, for the polls. Um, so, <laughs> while collecting your sample, the tails came off some of your macroinvertebrates. And as you saw, that's a very real problem. Sometimes the tails come off. But what is another way that we can easily tell uh, if it's a stonefly or a mayfly? And I mentioned this um, in some earlier slides when I was talking about the stoneflies and mayflies. All right, we're at 15, 16, 17, 18. We're 20, all right, and we're closing in three and two and one. And check out what everybody selected. So most of you said to initially look at the number of claws if the tails came off, and that is right. Because uh, if you remember, mayflies just have one claw and stoneflies have two. So uh, I guess what, what macroinvertebrate are we looking at in this sample? You can say in the comments. We've got stonefly, somebody said. Anyone yeah. else? Uh, yep, stonefly. Ah, totally, stonefly. That is correct. Um, okay. So this is just the last picture that I want to show you today. And this is um, a sample of macroinvertebrates that I took while I was studying them in college. And I just wanted to show you this as like a real life example. Um, this is looking at them under a microscope. And you can tell that, you know, they come in all different sizes. You can see that we have a big stonefly right here. And then we have a little tiny stonefly right here. Same thing with the midges. You can see that there's a big midge right here and then a little midge right here. So they really just change uh, in size and shape. Um, and there's just a great variety of macroinvertebrates. And you can see this big one right here. I actually don't know what this one is, but it is very cool looking. Um, so that is all I have for you today. And I just really hope that you feel inspired the next time you are at a stream or a river just to pick up rocks and look at what's under there and just really explore benthic macroinvertebrates. They are very cool. They look cool. They do so many cool things. Um, yeah, so thank you all so much for having me today. This has been fun. Thanks, Al. Oh, thank you so much. This was fantastic. I was hoping we'd still get to do this this year, especially with the quarantining. And you, you made it happen, Ryan. Thank you so much. So everybody, let's yeah. give Ryan a, a round of applause if you go to the reactions and choose the clapping hand. Yay, thank you. <laughs> and uh, this year, uh, I'm going to still, one of these coming Thursday science zooms, I'm gonna go down to Chimicum Creek where we go every year. I'm gonna take my, uh, I've got here one of the LabQuest uh, sensor interface devices. I'm gonna use the probes and sensors and I'm gonna get the data. I wanna do it while zooming so you guys can virtually come with me and we can stay physically apart and safe. Uh, but I definitely want you to have data this year because we're going to use that data like sixth graders have been doing for the past like 17 or 18 years. We can't miss a year. So stay tuned for that. Uh, so if you guys have any questions for Ryan, uh, you can type them in the chat room and either Ms. Berg or I can um, unmute you if you want to say it or we can read it for you however you want but this is your chance for any questions uh, before we end the meeting 
So there's a question, are they edible? Wow. Um, I'm actually not sure. <laughs> I mean, maybe some of them are, but I don't want to say for sure or not. <laughs> for sure for salmon, right? <laughs> and for the carnivorous ones. Birds. <laughs> now there's a question about, are they good pets and can you keep them as pets? Um, you know, so I, I actually took some macroinvertebrates home with me to look at a little closer in a dish and they actually died like really quickly because there wasn't like enough oxygen in the water and the water got warmer. Um, and so they really need like good, like river, cold, lots of oxygen water. So I think they'd be hard to keep as pets. Yeah, we've had that same problem. Usually when this happens in the classroom, um, you would bring it in the morning and then take it out for each class. And by a third period or the last class of the day, a lot of them are dead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you'd have to keep the water moving and really, really cold. Creek water mm -hmm. is very cold and that's just not sustainable at home. There's a question there from Leland. Uh, let's see. How long have you been working at the Salmon Coalition? So I have been working at the Salmon Coalition just since January. But actually, when I was in high school, I was a part of the Salmon Coalition's education programs. And I would volunteer for them in high school. Um, but yeah, so I've had a long history with the Salmon Coalition, but I just started working there uh, in January. Cool. And there's another question, can they live in the ocean? Um, like there are um, like invertebrates in the ocean, but they aren't called, I don't think they're called benthic macroinvertebrates. I think that just refers to streams and rivers. And so there's a similar question about can they live in salt water? So there's probably no. salt water species and freshwater species, right? Yeah. So uh, benthic macroinvertebrates, they just live in freshwater. But there are definitely uh, other invertebrates that live in the ocean. Yeah. Can I unscreen share? I guess. <laughs> there you go. All right. Now we can have a view of everyone who's here. I know it's nice to be able to see each other. So everybody say hi. Oh, Pat. <laughs> I see <you> Pat. <laughs> Ryan, will you be working with the seventh graders as well? Um, you know. I um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I was working with, with seventh grade, I was working with uh, the seventh graders uh, at Blue Heron and Squim earlier. Uh, yeah. Cool. Okay. <laughs> so there's a question there about do they have relatives? You talk about the bugs. Yeah. Do they have relatives? Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, what, what do you mean? They come from all the same egg bundle, I suppose. Hmm. Are they related to dinosaurs? Well, I think a lot of things are related to dinosaurs. Like chickens. Chickens are related to dinosaurs, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like birds. birds. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, but they do kind of look like dinosaurs, don't they? Yeah. And there's a good question there about, are there ones that can live in both freshwater and saltwater? Mm. Um, you know, I, if there are, I haven't heard of them. Yeah, me neither. Maybe they're called something else. Oh, I wonder, yeah, what they would look like in estuaries. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ooh, that's a good, yeah, because I'm sure there's invertebrates in estuaries. Yeah. yeah. Can caterpillars live in the river? 
Um, like, no, I don't think so. Like if you have a caterpillar that's like turning into a butterfly, those just live on land, I think. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Last chance. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you again, uh, Ryan, and thank you, Ms. Berg, for co-hosting and help uh, monitor the chat. Um, and it's great seeing you all. I miss you guys. I mean, some of you are growing up and changing, and we don't get to see you. So that's, that's sad. Um, but hopefully we'll see you when school gets back in session, even though you'll be over at the junior, senior high. But uh, we do want to see you, so come visit and say hi. Um, but that's our Zoom meeting for today. And with that, I'm going to end the meeting and bid you all a great rest of your day. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Good to see you, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, Take good care. to see you. Bye-bye. <laughs>